I mean, well, he, he or, the question was how do how do poor people eat good food? Let's just put it that way, okay? Um, so I'm going to back up and make this really easy. McDonald's is not cheap. Um, what I always boil it down to is I boil it down to laziness and I blame everything on the parents because you can go to a farmer's market and you can buy a chicken and some vegetables and you can go home. It may cost a little bit more than McDonald's, but instead of taking it and throwing it out, the next day you make a stock, a soup, and now all of a sudden you're cheaper than McDonald's. It, it's a matter of making choices. It's not, I mean, I understand the whole income disparity thing and, you know, eventually just as a society, you know it's going to come to a head. Period. End of story. We don't need to go there. But whether you're rich or poor, you need to make those types of conscious decisions. And doing farmer's markets, rich people come and poor people come. It is their decision to come and buy that kind of food to feed their families and they may scrap the $600 iPhone. You know, you need to make decisions. So I don't want to 100% buy into the rich poor thing. I'm more buy into you need to make decisions to protect your family. And I've seen it. I mean, I, I think the whole thing about this documentary is I, I went into this cold. I honestly had no idea what I was doing. Nothing. And so what I've seen and what I've been exposed to is from a very, very clear objective standpoint. So I've seen both sides of it. And, and it really does just boil down to making that choice. Are you going to go home at night and cook? Or are you going to say, Ugh, and you're going to go to the drive through or you're going to do, you know, something. Oh, I don't have time. You know, it's a, it's a conscious choice that you need to make in order to protect your family. I think people... Most people, except for maybe three to five million people in the whole entire country, do not realize how toxic our food system really, really is. Here, we'll get to you. Hey, uh, Chris, old, I'm kind of in denial about this, an old Islander. Um, I'd like to be a young Islander again. I would like to do what you're doing. And, um, oh yeah, I'm crazy. <laughs> but um, Never too old. I'm a cancer patient, and um, I'm pissed off. You know, I feel like I've been lied to, and um, I feel like I just fucking woke up from a 62-year coma and like been hit in the face with a sledgehammer. But you know, I am, well, maybe not a sledgehammer. You know, just it's been. But before me, and um, excuse my language, but I think we're mostly adults here. And, um, the F word, I'll try and stop. <laughs> uh, not use that one. But anyway, I'm really pissed off, and um, I uh, only I can make the changes necessary. So I'm going to do what I can. It's not too late for you. To now, I mean, listen. If somebody like you could be an example to the people around you if you have grandkids or your children are feeding their kids a certain way it really really is important to stress this because you know you, you need to educate people on exactly what is in the food and then the decision becomes very very easy on on what to do hi there um, I have watched uh, about every documentary that I can get my hands on over the years from King Gorn to Super Size Me and I, I think I recall from one of them that because the GMOs have the uh, license and patents on all their seed, that and you, you were driving down that field and you showed your corn on one side and the corn on the other side, when their, when their corn pollinates from the wind blowing <coughs> over to yours, if they decide they want to come after you, they can to force you, I think, because they're... they're Pat, their, their patented corn pollen ends up in your seed. And if they uh, get their hands on yours, then, they, then they're suing farmers for patent infringement, essentially, because you're not paying the license fees. So it's sort of, you know, you mentioned, you showed that one company, Ellsworth, where you're buying your seed or some of your feed, and that they're using, um, you know, uh, uh, old stock, but is there really any, is there truly any old stock? And is it just a question of time at this point with the way that 
the laws are now and the way that these companies have protected themselves, uh, that eventually they're just, they are pushing out everybody who has that type of, um, I don't know if native is the right word, but the sort of uh, 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 heritage uh, seeds. No. <laughs> okay. um, no, I'm, I'm going to tell you actually the reality of the whole Monsanto thing. It's not, um, it's not a corn drifting pollen thing. Um, the American rural economy was built around a grain mill. Uh, and every farmer sold grain and then bought grain from that mill. So this was like fish in a barrel for Monsanto. You don't hear about those lawsuits anymore because obviously it's kind of caught on and they locked down that market. But what happened was the farmer who bought his grain from the local grain mill for his entire life went to the grain mill and bought his seed not knowing that it was genetically modified seed, planted it, so they kind of knew who they who it was sold to. So it was very, very easy for them to start slapping these lawsuits around. We test with an Envirologics uh, tester uh, all of the corn. We have zero tolerance. That cornfield across the street was, wasn't mine. That was a dairy farm. We plant pretty far away from anything, by the way. But we test, um, we test everything. Um, and we still are coming up clean. It's not necessarily the drift as these guys were buying from mills and the Monsanto seed guys knew exactly who bought it. So slapping a lawsuit on them was pretty much, you know, pretty much a gimme. But there is a real vibrant uh, seed stock that still exists in this country. And if you want to hear something you know, if you want to hear something kind of scary, 90% of the organic and non-GMO corn that comes into this country, that's used in this country, comes from foreign countries. We would have to plant 4 million acres of organic and GMO corn in this country just to meet the demand of our country alone. So the marketplace is actually enormous. It's a matter of us um, coming together, establishing these grain mills, and exploiting the opportunity, which is which is really huge right now. Sam? Yes. How can we leverage your kind of farming and your passion into a national organization that would be just as powerful as Monsanto? Listen, there, there's two things, okay? Uh, you know, walking up against a system that is so firmly entrenched in our government um, is really is really kind of a waste of time. A lot of it is getting people. I mean, I mean, listen, in Europe they don't have this because the people are smart enough and they don't buy it. So if they don't buy it, the supermarket doesn't stock it. It's very very easy. You know, it's very very easy to do that. What you need to focus on is building the infrastructure in the United States. Every single town, every single community was centered around these grain mills. And these grain mills allowed farmers just the economic movement of money in the fall, money, and then money in the, during the season, and then buying back and forth of seed. So everybody prospered. Like Everybody thinks that this is such a huge problem this is going back in time and using an old economic model that built this country and putting it into effect. Very, very plain and, and simple. It's, it's what I do with my foundation is the same thing. We are actually putting up our first grain mill in about three weeks. And what it's going to do is be a catalyst for change within the Northeast because we are going to push the seed slowly out of the Northeast to make it really large swaths of area that are actually GMO free. And if you want it to get even crazier, the appellate courts have held up that town by town you can go and you can ban the propagation of GMO crops. So if across the country or across the Northeast we started spreading that and people started to vote, started to vote for it, we could be in a position also on the political side 
to gain momentum there. But I really think, of like all my research, my, my Wall Street background, that bringing back that old economic business model that existed a hundred years ago is really the way to bring back the sustainability of small farms in rural America. Hey John, before we, we take the next question, make sure before we end tonight, you mentioned how people can get on your mailing list, how they can get on your blog and all that good stuff, your foundation website and all that. Do we have another question out there? <coughs> Any, yeah, okay, here. Hi, I want to thank you for all you're doing. And I'm curious to know, do any grocery stores carry products like yours or others? I mean, is, it, it, do you have to go to a farmer's market to buy the bean food that you're taught? Or here on the island, is there a grocery store? This, this is, this is, is it, is this is it, plain and simple. In order for any farm to produce enough product to be able to supply a grocery store chain, they have to cut corners, they have to use chemicals, they have to grow stuff in a completely not good way. I don't know how to put it. So realistically, yes, you have to, if you really want to, I mean, you know, that's the whole thing. You have to go to the farmer's market, put it in your schedule, like make time for it, make it a priority it's a you know it's a choice but that is the long and short of it organic conventional whatever it is if you have somebody who has the ability to grow enough to supply a supermarket eh, no <laughs> luckily on the island as you know we do have several farmers markets we have morning glory and I think Jim is here is he still here somewhere yeah yeah you can do a shout out, Jim. I can give you, you can talk about what your experience has been, you know, in terms of supplying the vineyard for many, many years with good, clean food. And, and I know you work with other farmers and other meat producers. I was trying to avoid this. <laughs> it, uh, it's such a huge topic that there's so many angles that it takes on the. Uh, good food in supermarkets. I think that Whole Foods probably does a pretty good job, though I can't say I have an extensive experience there. But they do label things. He says no. <laughs> so that's interesting. I know that um, for our farm stand, we can find organic food in Boston to bring in for the things that we don't grow, like apples and avocados or whatever it is. I don't do handle that into the business. My wife does, but <clears throat> there are, we're on our third wholesale supplier, so it doesn't seem like it's a difficulty finding one. Um, I like what you said, I like so much of what you said in the movie, uh, that so many of your experiences echo mine, and even your words. Um, the, um, the economic model you're talking about is something that comes to mind often when I think of how this country is practically at full employment and yet the income distribution is so um, unequal and we just <coughs> shot ourselves in the foot with an election and so the country is not functioning well. If we could put aside the usual capitalist and economic models that we've grown up with this far and go back to small farming and those 3,000 acre farms become 10, 300 acre farms, <clears throat> I believe that people would have meaningful work. I mean, what are they going to do? All their size, their jobs have been either shipped overseas or done by robots. And uh, what are people going to do in this country? There's not enough work and the population is too large. Put them back on the land, give them meaningful work. You know what it's like. And they will uh, care about what they produce. I think you're 100% right. Any more questions? Oh. Thank you so much. That film was excellent, and uh, what you, everything you said was fantastic. Um, yes, I, I'm glad somebody brought up Whole Foods because I've been very disappointed going in there, and um, I wanted to mention that they give the illusion. Uh, when you walk in that 
everything is wonderful and natural. But um, there's a small percentage of food in, in the stores that is actually organic. Is that right, John? It, it, listen, yeah. it's a supermarket. I mean, you can yeah. really can't say no more. If you're buying anything in quantity, and, and the, the other side of the coin is, you have to understand something very simple. The only reason why organic vegetables cost more than non-organic vegetables uh, is the cost of the chemicals. It's, I mean, the things that organic vegetables grown for a supermarket or something aren't sprayed or don't have any chemicals in them. It's just, you know, it's burying your hand in the, your head in the sand. So, you know, the whole model that Whole Foods came up with was actually great in the beginning, but now, quarter after quarter, for the past few years, they've been, you know, their numbers have been coming down and coming mm -hmm. down as they get, you know, displaced by the Walmarts who are importing cheap organic crap from China, and, you know, now organic stuff is cheap if you go to Walmart or something like that, because the whole system is just kind of, you know, it's just kind of caved under the pressure. So, you know, it, it's really hard. It's, it's actually a terrible thing that we in this country can't go to our supermarkets with a semi-clean conscience and have, you know, and have choices. You know, it, it really is not a very good thing that you're putting so much of the weight on small farms without giving them the economic benefit and distribution and stuff that, you know, bigger farms uh, can get. So. Whole Foods is going to be a prime example. I would honestly be surprised if Whole Foods is around in five years. I really would. Yeah, at one point we were um, battling the stop and shop here in Vineyard Haven trying uh, to get them not to build a big box store and uh, realized that they could not sell locally grown food because they were bonded to a distributor. Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, we bump up to, you know, yeah. you bump up to it with schools, you bump up to it with all these institutions. They have food contracts, and that's why yeah. kids in school are eating nuggets, you know, from China, because they have all these food contracts. I mean, yeah. you, listen, until people get, for lack of a better word, pissed off and really, really put their, you know, their anger into action. It, it, it just, it, it really, you know, it, it really won't, it really won't change. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thanks for coming. Fantastic. Yeah. Do you want one or two more questions? It's okay? Okay, go on. Go this way. Go here. Stop that. Yeah, I'm running around. Welcome to our life. What are you going to say? You're done. What is your take on certified? When you see certified organic, what does that mean? And how does it translate to what you're talking how does about? It mean, what does it mean to me? Well, to us, to all of us. Uh, uh, listen, I'll say it again. Organic vegetables grown in the United States on a commercial level are sprayed. Period. End of story. So, well, you know, you have a group of organic certifiers that are board members from McDonald's and board members from Monsanto and people in the food industry. So all it has become is another level uh, of marketing. Now, the other thing is the United States government, when something comes in from Peru or China or whatever, they don't go to Peru and China to look at those farms and certify them. If a third party certifier in China says it's organic, when it gets to our border, that's when we look at it and we say, Ching, you know, organic. So you're trusting a third party certifier in another country where eek. So, you know, it's, it's not to be fooled. I mean, you know, people really need to understand how important this small farm is to not only the local economy, but on the grander scale of sustainability and, and you know, and your health, the statistics, the statistics don't lie. I mean, we are an incredibly sick country. I mean, we are one in 65 right now in autism. It's one in a thousand in Denmark. I mean, you want to put two and two together here? It's, you know, it's very, very simple. So I always tell people don't be fooled by, you know, 
the, the little green, you know, the little green label. You have to, you kind of have to make a balance. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for what you've shown us and taught us. Um, there was a saying I heard a few years ago, you probably know it, uh, it's that it's instead of you are what you eat, you are what you eat eats. And you demonstrated that super. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Is there some country in the um, perhaps the industrialized advanced category that you see as a promising a, uh, country to perhaps use as a model? <laughs> you, you want me to flip you out? Yeah. Russia and the Ukraine. Yeah. <laughs> why is that? Uh, the Ukraine is the most productive agricultural country in all of Europe. Uh, Russia has a, a national ban on GMOs. I mean, their their farming practices. You can't even you can't even bring the seeds into the country, hold them in your hand or anything. But you have to understand that you know across Europe, where if anybody travels to Europe, you know where do you go? There's people knocking their heads off of chickens in the markets, and you know people are going there one, two, three times. They don't go on a Saturday when they have time and buy four hundred dollars worth of you know groceries and come home and pack it away. They they just, they eat as they go. And so, you know, you have a lot of this in place across Europe and obviously the UK. But, you know, if you were to look at countries that are really, and listen, whether it's political or not, I don't care. It still isn't, you know, it still is an action. But if you look at Italy, if you look at these countries across Europe where the consciousness and food, I mean, they just realize that food is so important to your future and your future health. You know, you're seeing it there. So, you know, I always say that when logic goes out the window, it's because corruption threw it out the window. So, you know, we're in a country right now where, you know, look at our policymakers and, you know, election or otherwise. I mean, I don't want to get into politics, but the president before approved more genetically modified crops than all of his predecessors. So not any president has been better than any other when it comes to this because all of the wheels are greased by certain companies that go in and obviously the previous administration there was 18 policymakers that had affiliations with Monsanto which is why you had hormones in milk and why you have so many of these you know, genetically modified crops. So you have a level of corruption in this country that is so high that it really needs to come from the people. You, know, you go read a history book about the Greeks and Romans. It, it, it has to come from the people. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm, uh, I've come from Scotland. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the UK a few uh, few moments ago. Uh, now, some of you may know, and I presume probably all of you do, that the UK is uh, departing from the European Union someday in the next couple of years. Yeah. Now, it seems to me that the European Union has protected the UK, uh, despite uh, what the, uh, we might have voted from a lot of uh, GMOs and handled <coughs> chemicals. Uh, it may not be perfect, but it's done something there. Uh, now, I am worried now because what will happen when we uh, float on the world uh, trade market is that we are going to be pressurized to use standards which will be basically American standards. So my question really is, uh, is the, the revolution that you hope for in American agriculture going to come in time for my grandchildren? <laughs> Huh. If I have anything to do with it, yes. I can't tell you any more than that. Yeah. You know, just you know, another thing on the whole Brexit thing, and I don't, I, I don't like to talk politics, but a lot of the guys running the European Union are very pro-GMO, it's the level below them and the people that have really kept it out of the countries, to be honest with you, because 
the people that have, you know, a level of consciousness. In the UK, uh, you know, there's this guy hanging around who is a successor to the throne, you know, uh, Charles over there, and he is very, very anti-GMO. And I think you're going to see for the first time um, royalty become a little bit activist when it comes. But, you know, one of the most important things you say for your grandchildren I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna give you something right now. Statistically, children born in 2000 and after, their parents have a greater chance of outliving them. And that is, you know, I, I don't just come up with this stuff. I was, I was an investment banker. I do research. I honestly try to approach this GMO thing in the most objective possible way in hopes that it wasn't the hell that I thought it was. That, to be honest with you, I really didn't want to find what I found. But these statistics just all speak for themselves. And that's why I don't understand. I say it all the time on my email. At what point do people just just flip out over this. I think, like, what is it going to take to get people to just, you know, to, to, to really change, to really realize, like, you have children, you have grandchildren, what are you planning on leaving them? Like, all of this stuff is very obvious. What do you plan on leaving these kids? Period. And I don't understand why that doesn't get everybody in, into the streets.